The advent of AI shows that multilateral cooperation is more important than ever. It's a challenge that will require us to break out of our own echo chambers and consider the broad interest of humanity. Good morning, I'm Heather Long, a columnist and editorial board member at The Post, and I'm thrilled to be joined this morning with Gita Gopinath, the first deputy managing director of the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, and a renowned economist who just got back from Morocco, I believe. So, okay, we've talked about the politics of AI, we've talked about the defense capabilities of AI, let's talk about the economics of AI. And the number one question that we get at the post is, how many jobs are going to be lost from AI? You know, is, how, what's the best estimate from the IMF? Well, it's a pleasure to join you, Heather. And indeed, that is a top question that we are studying. So I think the way you want to think about it is what fraction of the labor force is exposed to the new technology, and especially generative AI. And it varies by country. So if you take the case of the US or the UK, we're talking about an exposure of 60 to 70% of the labor force that's exposed to AI. But that's not enough to know because the technology could be great in the sense that it could complement the workforce, which is raise the productivity of the worker. But alternatively, it could be a substitute for the worker. So that's the important question is, so not just the level of exposure, but whether it complements human labor or it substitutes for human labor. And that's where we've been looking at this more carefully to see how much of a substitution might you see. So if you take the case of the US, we have an estimate that about 60% of the workforce is exposed to AI, but only about, and about half of that gets a complementary effect. So about, we're talking about 30% then of the labor force for whom this technology can be productivity enhancing and can complement labor as we're substituting it. Similarly in the UK. But then if you look at, for instance, a country like India, where a large portion of the workforce is in, say, agriculture, their exposure to AI is only around 30%. If you look at Brazil and South Africa, we're looking at numbers like 40%. So again, I get the question is that you know, this is clearly a general purpose technology, which is why it's having such a wide effect on we're discussing this here, uh, but the question is what's going to be the impact on, uh, on productivity, and that varies by country. And it also varies, I think, by gender. If I read some of your research from the IMF, can you tell us why women may be more impacted? Yeah, so if you look at, again, in terms of exposure, women tend to be in areas like uh, in the retail sector and mostly services sector where there is greater exposure to AI. But again, that could, it's kind of, if it's an even bag in terms of whether it's helping raise productivity of women or substituting for it. So that's a mixed bag, but they certainly have higher exposure. Now, in, again, in countries where they are agricultural driven economies where women are also employed, they don't get affected as such. So let me give you, for instance, an example of this difference between exposure versus uh, you know, complementarity and substitutability. Radiologists, for instance, we know are one occupation which is very exposed to uh, AI. I mean, the whole image recognition, the ability to detect anomalies and images, something very powerful that can be done. But at the same time, it's unlikely that society is going to say, well, we're going to let a machine entirely determine uh, and do the diagnosis, like completely replace a human being with a machine. It's much more dangerous to do that. So this is an area where there is a lot of complementarity and you could be effectively raising the productivity of radiologists. But on the other hand, if you look at say clerical workers who are very exposed to AI, in that particular case, you know, the cost of errors are somewhat smaller. Uh, and therefore, those are the kinds of jobs that will get replaced. Hmm. You also mentioned productivity. I mean, if anybody takes their economics class, their first one in college, you know, you basically learn that things can get better, uh, growth can happen if you either work more hours or if you work smarter, if you work more productively. Uh, it sounds like you keep using this word complementary um, for AI. How much of a boost could this potentially be? Is, is this comparable to an industrial revolution? How do we think through how this could boost global well-being? 
Yep. I mean, economies are kind of looking for the holy grail of where the next boost in productivity will come from. And AI certainly offers great promise. So the question is, you know, what kind of an effect will it have? Uh, we have what we call firm level studies done, you know, using firm specific data, which shows that the effect can be, based on current studies, can be quite substantial. On average, it can raise labor productivity growth by two to three percentage points. Now, just to put that in context, over the last 15 years, on average, labor productivity growth in the US has been a little over 1%. So if you're going to add two to three percentage points, that would be very large. And some of these numbers, in fact, you know, studies get numbers close to seven percentage points, which are large. But I think we should be very careful because you know, to extrapolate from these numbers to what we might see for the economy as a whole, because one, this is on very specific firms. Uh, it's not clear whether it's going to apply to other sectors. Uh, and secondly, one of the things that we've always struggled with when it comes to general purpose technology is to envision what the economy will look like. You know, there are going to be occupations and sectors that we cannot imagine at this point that may come around. And therefore, it's just inherently very difficult. The last time we had a boom in labor productivity was in the second half of the 1990s, thanks to the uh, IT boom. Uh, and that was when productivity growth was around 2.5%. After that, it's been around 1% on average. So again, uh, the prospects are there, but it's an inherently complex estimate to make. The estimates that are coming out seem very promising. Yeah, and but I wonder as well, you were speaking about the differences between the impact on the United States and the UK and other advanced economies versus what we traditionally call developing world. Does this just exacerbate inequality? Are you concerned it just creates this really big divide between winners and losers? It is going to uh, affect different segments of the labor force in different ways within countries and, of course, across countries. So if, let me start with, if I look across countries, uh, you know, developing countries have uh, relied to an important extent in terms of their growth, in terms of their exports, on their labor abundance, on the relative labor abundance. Right? Uh, and since it's clear that this new technology will displace the need for some kinds of labor, for sure, that puts developing countries at uh, a disadvantage. Secondly, to be able to use this technology, you need vast amounts of data. The, the infrastructure is needed for that. These are expensive uh, investments. And again, developing countries don't are in a disadvantage at this point relative to advanced economies. So that could generate uh, greater disparity. Now, within countries, again, it's different depending upon whether you have a college degree and you're able to then therefore you know, enhance your productivity because of this new technology versus if you're going to get replaced by it. One interesting difference relative to what we saw during the last uh, revolution, uh, you know, kind of automation-driven effects, is that we might see some leveling off also. We might see some less polarization, especially at the lower to mid end. Because what we're seeing is that the experience that comes with working multiple years, that what you gain from that and the premium that's on it might actually shrink mm. because that knowledge that comes with experience can be much easily transferred to newer entrants into the labor force. Uh, and that is something that we, we are seeing in some uh, experiments in the data. Yeah, that would be a huge shift for sure for many of us and how we think about our careers and our lives. Um, so the last panel was talking us through some of the risks to a potential global war or other tragedy that could come if AI is misused. We obviously think a lot about financial stability, you know, what could happen to the global economy. I was struck, you know, Gary Gensler, the head of the American Securities and Exchange Commission, obviously he has to spend his day thinking about risks to the economy, and he recently said that he thought it was almost certain in the next 10 years AI could cause a financial crisis. That really surprised me. Do you agree with that? What, what would drive a financial crisis? I mean, again, you know, we, the, the promises of, uh, from AI are great, and you see the financial services industry you know, grabbing onto it. But the risks are immense. And, and, and 
the risks range all the way from you know, ethical issues to existential issues. So it's a huge spectrum, and you've been covering this in the, with your uh, previous speakers. So yes, you know, as, the, as the IMF, we focus more on issues of economic stability and financial stability. So let's look at, for instance, on financial stability. I can go into many different areas, but one of the things you always worry about when it comes to financial stabilities and what creates systemic risks is a herd mentality a herding behavior, kind of sentiment-driven uh, investment. And in this environment where you have very few models that everybody relies on for making predictions, for making decisions, for instance, on what to invest in and where to invest, we worry that that could just put herd mentality on steroids. And that is uh, an important risk that we have to pay attention to. The second thing is, this technology, remarkable as it is, it's also hard to explain what, you know, how the outcomes are coming about because it's incredibly complicated. And so exposed, to, you know, when, you, when things go wrong and you have to make a, give your explanation to your shareholders about why exactly did you make these decisions, that's going to, the lack of transparency, the lack of uh, being able to, to tell what's driving these decisions is, is going to be very difficult. So that's one whole set of issues. Then, of course, there is the other, sep the other set of issues would come with uh, data privacy. Hmm. Uh, the data has to be, in most cases, confidential. There is a real risk that with this kind of technology that you could be putting out unknowingly, unintentionally confidential data uh, in the public domain, and that is incredibly risky. We worry about what happens if you have you know, AI bots that are basically determining underwriting standards or figuring out who gets a loan, because we know that embedded bias is a big problem with uh, this technology. So there are multiple aspects uh, that we're paying close attention to. You know, another theme that we keep hearing over and over again today is the need for global rules around AI because of these challenges and risks, whether military, financial, or data privacy that you've just spoken about. Um, but that's really hard to get all these nations to agree on anything. We've seen many trade issues in just the last few years. What gives you hope that we could potentially have some sort of global rules of the world for AI? I am hopeful because I think uh, everybody uh, across the world recognizes that there are some very big risks associated with this technology. You know, and I have the opportunity to sit at G7 and G20 meetings, and I haven't heard disagreement on this. I think there is, a, there is common agreement that this uh, requires world attention. There's also common understanding that no country is alone in this and can handle it all because this is a truly globally cross-cutting issue. Uh, so in that sense, it, there is a similarity to climate. And to the extent that we have uh, been, you know, we have the Paris Agreement, for instance, which, you know, it does have its limitations, but that is a global agreement that came about, kind of have a common framework to think about how to deal with climate change. You could see a parallel for work on uh, AI and generative AI. Similarly, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is this fantastic expert group that g gives you knowledge about how to deal with climate change. Something similar on AI would be very helpful. Well, I hope you're right, although we know there's been struggles on the climate agreement. Uh, so we've been asking every panelist so far, what keeps you up at night on AI? You've already outlined a number of challenges, but it, you know, what's that, that top issue that you worry about? Well, I think firstly, Things are moving so quickly, and I, I sit in on and listen to enough technologists who, uh, you know, spook you completely, telling you that this can all change dramatically in a year or in two years. Uh, so it's just the speed with which the technology is progressing relative to the speed with which policymakers are able to keep up with it. And like I said, the multiple dimensions of how this could impact. Uh, societies is immense. For instance, I do worry that as phenomenal as this technology is, it's heavily driven in the private sector by mm. private money. Uh, you know, if you go back and you look at, for instance, 2014, 2015, where did most of the machine learning models come from? They came from academia, they came from universities. And now, if you look at where the newest models are coming from, they're entirely from the private sector. And there's a huge gap, right? I mean, there's a huge difference. So I think that's, it would be a mistake not to ensure that there is enough public funding, for instance, for universities 
to make sure that they are able to also be at the frontier producing this knowledge, because that's how we as a society will also figure out what's best and what's not, not as good. Well, let's end on a little bit of an optimistic note. Um, if you follow economics, the United States GDP number came out this morning. It was a blockbuster number, growth in the third quarter in the United States of 4.9%. You know, we were supposed to be in a recession now. Instead, we've accelerated growth. How did this happen? How did we end up in such a good place? Yeah, no, it is. I, just to concur, it is a blockbuster number. If you look at how often a number like that shows up, it's around 10% of the time in terms of, you know, if you look at the distribution of uh, growth rates. So this is, uh, this is a very, uh, very, you know, strong growth number. It has come in substantially above what we were expecting for this quarter. In, the, in terms of why, again, we were expecting it to be a lower number, so we're going to have to go back and, and rethink this. But what is true is the US labor market is very strong. It, yes, we have seen some softening, but it is still an incredibly strong labor market, and that plays a very important role in consumer decisions and spending. We still have the, uh, in the residual effects of what came with the you know, support that was provided to households and firms and including the, you know, the desire to now to kind of rebound from the pandemic, that effect is still there. Uh, and fiscal policy in the US is obviously highly procyclical, or which is it's very loose, depending upon you know, looking at where these indicators are. It is a question of how much that is contributing to these growth numbers. I think our assessments are that could be relatively small, but still, uh, you know, we have a fiscal policy that is really, in terms of a deficit of 8%, is quite large given where the economy is. And lastly, can this keep going? Can the U.S. manage this soft landing to avoid a recession? You, know, the, uh, you all, for instance, have forecast slower growth for the United States and much of the world next year. But obviously, this year has defied expectations, at least in, in this country. Yeah. The resilience of the US is, rem is remarkable. And that kind of actually also stands out relative to what we're seeing in other parts of the world. So there was a time when there was a little bit more commonality. But the US is doing, is, growth is much stronger, for instance, than what we're seeing in Europe, uh, where, on the other hand, indicators are more tipping towards contraction territory. This is a bit, there is a big difference here. Our baseline is you know, for a soft landing in the US, and this additional data point certainly makes the case stronger. But that said, I mean, again, looking ahead, I think the one thing we have to notice is the fact that long-term rates, long-end long interest rates are going up, and they've gone up quite substantially over the last few weeks. And that, we expect, will feed into uh, you know, spending behavior. So it probably can't keep going like this. Probably not more 4.9% if we meet again in January. I would be very surprised, yes. All right. Uh, Gita Gopina, thank you for your comments and insights today. Thank you. Stay tuned. Our next guest is running out. Thank you. <laughs>